Top 10, top I got a top 10, 10. Top 10. Got my motivation high for my top 10, my top 10. Gotta learn from the wise women and men Need motivation? Watch a top 10. The Belief Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and this channel was created to help you overcome the number one challenge that is holding you back, a lack of belief in yourself. You watch these videos because you know there's something greater inside you as well. You've got Michael Jordan level talent at something. So get ready for some leadership building ideas from Jeff Bezos in my take on his top 10 rules of success, volume five, to give you the belief that you need. Okay, let's kick it off with rule number one, act on your ideas. I came across the fact, um, so this is 1994, nobody has heard of the internet, very, very few people. And I came across the fact that the web, World Wide Web, was growing at something like 2,300% a year. This is in 1994, and anything growing that fast is, even if its baseline usage today is tiny, it's growing so fast, it's gonna be big. And so I looked at that and I was like, there's gotta be, a, I should come up with a business idea and the, you know, on the internet and then let the internet grow around this and we can keep working on it. And so I made a list of products that I might sell online and I started force ranking them. And I picked books because books are super unusual in one respect, which is that there are more book items in the book category than there are items in any other category. There are three million different books active and in print around the world at any given time. So my, my, the founding idea of Amazon was to build universal selection of books. The biggest bookstores only had 150,000 titles. And so that's what I did. And, and, and I, you know, I hired a small team and we built, we built the software. I moved to Seattle. I mean, you told your parents you were going to quit D.E. Shaw where you were successful, making presumably a fair amount of money. Yeah. And you told your wife, Mackenzie, that you're yeah. going to move across the country. What did they all say? They were immediately and reflexively supportive right after they asked the question, what's the internet? Rule number two, delight the customers. We haven't had any existential crises, knock on wood. I, find, I don't want to jinx anything. Um, but we've had a lot of uh, kind of dramatic events. I remember um, there, early on, we only had 125 employees when Barnes & Noble, who, the big U United States bookseller, um, opened their online website to compete against us, barnesandnoble.com. We'd had about a two-year window. We opened in 95, they opened in 97. And at that time, all of the headlines, and the funniest were about how we were about to be destroyed by this much larger company. We had 125 employees and $60 million a year in annual sales, 60 million with an M. And that, uh, and Barnes and Noble at the time had 30,000 employees and about $3 billion in sales. So it, they were giant, we were tiny, and we had limited resources. And the, the headlines were um, very negative about Amazon. And the, the one that's most memor memorable was just Amazon.toast. And, um, <laughs> and so I called an all hands meeting, which was not hard to do with just 125 people. And we got in a room and, because it was so um, scary for all of us, this idea that now we finally had a big competitor, that literally everybody's parents were calling and saying, you know, are you okay? Is the, you know, it's usually the moms um, calling and asking their children, are you gonna be okay? So, and I said, look, you know, it, it's okay to be afraid, um, but don't be afraid of our competitors because they're never gonna send us any money. Be afraid of our customers. And if we just stay focused on them, and, 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 and instead of obsessing over this big competitor that we just got, that we'll be fine. Um, and I really do believe that. I think that if you stay focused, then the more uh, drama there is and everything else, no matter what the drama is, whatever the external distraction is, the, the, what your, your response to it should be to double down on the customer, satisfying them, not just satisfying them, delighting them. Rule number three, follow your calling. You don't choose your passions, your passions choose you. And all of us are gifted with certain passions and the people who are lucky are the ones who get to follow those things. 
And I always advise our uh, young employees, I meet with interns and so on, you can have, and my kids too, you can have a job, or you can have a career, or you can have a calling. And if you can somehow figure out how to have a calling, you have hit the jackpot, because that's the big deal. Rule number four, grow your vision. What propelled you to sell things more than books? Uh, after books, we started selling music, and then we started selling um, videos. And then I got smart and I, um, I emailed a, a, a thousand randomly selected customers and asked them, besides the things we sell today, what would you like to see us sell? And that answer came back incredibly long-tailed. The way they answered the question was with whatever they were looking for at that moment. So like, I remember one of the answers was, I wish you sold windshield wiper blades because I really need windshield wiper blades. <laughs> and I thought to myself, we can sell anything this way. And, um, and then, so then we launched uh, electronics and toys and many other categories over time. And the, the vision became, because you read the original business plan, it's just books. Also, if you want to have more confidence, check out my 254 series. It's free. The link to join is in the description below. Stress primarily comes from not taking action. If you absolutely can't tolerate critics, then don't do anything new or interesting. If everything has to work in two to three years, then that limits what you can do. Rule number five, have good role models. We all get um, gifts. Uh, we get certain things in our life that, are, um, uh, that we're very lucky about. And one of the most powerful one is who your early role models are. You know, you could, they could be it your parents. It was your grand grandfather. It was yeah. in a big sense. My, my mom and dad, but my mm. grandfather too. And you know, I had, my mom had me when she was uh, 17 years old and she was still in high school in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And this is in 1964. I can assure you that being a pregnant uh, teenager in high school was not cool in Albuquerque, New Mexico at that time. And uh, so uh, it's, in, in, so it was a very, it was difficult for her. My grandfather went to bat for her when they tried to kick her out of school. And, you know, he, they're, they're incredible. I had, to, so the gift I had is I had this incredible family. Rule number six, maintain a day one culture. Now that you have about 600,000 employees, I calculate that you're adding about 250 people a day. Um, you've mentioned that you're trying to fend off day two. Yeah. And you've said that day two is stasis, followed by irrelevance, followed by excruciatingly painful decline, followed by death. That yeah. is why it is always day one. Yeah. I, so I, yeah. How's that work? Well, so day one, um, this is a phrase that we use at Amazon all the time. I've been using it since my first annual shareholder letter from 20 years ago. Um, and we say it's always day one. And it needs to be day one for the reason that you just mentioned. Um, and how do you, so the real question for me is how do you go about maintaining a day one culture? You know, it's great to have the, um, the scale of Amazon, we have financial resources, we have lots of brilliant people, we can accomplish great things, we have global scopes, we have operations all over the world, but the downside of that is that you can lose your nimbleness, you can lose your entrepreneurial spirit, you can lose your, that kind of heart that, the, the, that, um, that small companies often have. And so if you could have the best of both worlds, if you can have that entrepreneurial spirit and heart, while at the same time having all the advantages that come with scale and scope, think, think of the things that you could do. And, and so how, the question is, how do you achieve that? Um, the, the scale is good because it makes you robust. You know, a, a, a big boxer can take a punch to the head. The question is, you also want to dodge those punches. So you'd like to be nimble. You want to be big and nimble. And I find that there are a lot of things that are protective of the day one mentality. I already spent some time on one of them, which is customer obsession. I think that's the most important thing. If you can, and it gets harder as you get bigger. When you're a little tiny company, say you're a 10 person startup company, every single person in the company is focused on the customer. When you get to be a bigger company, you've got all the middle, you've got middle managers and you've got all these layers and the, those people aren't on the front lines. They're not interacting with customers every day. They're insulated from customers, and they start to manage not the customer uh, happiness directly, but they start to manage through proxies like metrics and processes, and some of those things can become bureaucratic. So it's very challenging, but 
one of the things that happens is the decision making velocity slows down. And I think the reason, one of the reasons that that happens is that people, all say junior executives inside the big company, start to uh, model all decisions as if they are heavyweight, irreversible, highly consequential decisions. And so even two-way doors, you could make, you make a decision, it's the wrong decision, you can just back up, back through the door and try again. Even those reversible decisions start to be made with heavyweight processes. And so you can teach people that these pitfalls and, and, and traps and then teach them to avoid those traps. And that's what we're trying to do at Amazon so that we can maintain our inventiveness and our heart and our kind of small company spirit even as we have the scale and scope of a larger company. Rule number seven, be a good leader. I'm actually a big fan of anecdotes in business, not building a narrative structure around them necessarily, but I still have uh, an email address that customers can write to. I see most of those emails and I don't answer very many of them anymore, but, but I see them and I, and I forward them, uh, some of them, the ones that catch my curiosity, I forward them to the executives in charge of that area with, with a question mark. And that question mark is just a shorthand for, can you look into this? Why is this happening? What does it, what's going on? And th what I find is very interesting, because we have tons of metrics. We have you know, weekly business reviews with these metric decks, and we look at our, we know so many things about customers and their, uh, their you know, whether we're delivering on time, uh, what, you know, whether the uh, packages have too much air in them and, you know, wasteful of packaging and so on. We have so many metrics that we monitor. And the thing I have noticed is that when the anecdotes and the data disagree, the anecdotes are usually right. There's something wrong with the way you're measuring it. And that's why it's so important to to keep your, you need the, to run something that you, where you're doing, you know, uh, shipping billions of packages a year. For sure, you need good data and metrics. Are you delivering on time? Are you delivering on time in every city? Are you delivering on time to apartment complexes? Are you delivering on time in certain countries? You do need the data. But then you need to check that data with your intuition and your instincts. And you need to teach that to the, all the senior executives uh, and, and junior executives too. Rule number eight, never be satisfied. The great thing about uh, humans in general is we're always improving things. And so entrepreneurs um, uh, and inventors, uh, and you know, they follow their curiosity and they follow their passions and they figure something out and then they figure out how to make it better and they're never satisfied. Uh, and, and you need to harness that, in my view, you need to harness that energy uh, primarily on your customers instead of on your competitors. And so where I see, I sometimes see companies and even young small startup companies, entrepreneurs go awry, is they start to pay more attention to their competition than they do to their customers. And I think that that, um, I think that in big mature industries, that can be, that might be, a winning approach in some cases, kind of close following. Let other people be the pioneers and, you know, uh, and, and go down the blind alleys. Mm. There's many things that, that, that a new inventive company tries won't work. Um, and so those mistakes and errors and failures do cost real money. Um, and, and, and so maybe in a mature industry where growth rates are slow and change is very slow. But as you see in the world more and more, there aren't very many Mature industries, change is happening everywhere. You know, we see it in the automobile industry with self-driving cars, and but you could go right down the line of every industry and you would see it. Rule number nine, make it happen. Was there a moment you thought, I might not make it? The riskiest moment for Amazon, Charlie, was uh, at the very, very beginning. I needed to raise a million dollars at a certain point. And I uh, ended up giving away 20% of the company for a million dollars. Hell of a deal for somebody. A lot of people did very well on that deal. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, they, but they also took a risk, so they deserved to do very well on that deal. But I, um, I had to take 60 meetings to raise a million dollars, and I raised it from 22 people at approximately $50,000 a person. And it was nip and tuck whether I was going to be able to raise that money. So the whole thing could have ended before it even started. That was 1995. 
you know, and the first question every investor asked me was, what's the internet? And rule number 10, the last one before a very special bonus clip is laugh. I loved high school. I had so much fun. We had, um, I, got, I lost my library privileges because I laughed too loudly in the library. And, what about uh, that laugh? Where did you get that laugh from? You know, it is distinctive. I've had that laugh all my life. There was a short, not that short, there was a multi-year period where my brother and sister would not see a movie with me because they thought it was too embarrassing. Um, and my, uh, but I don't know why I have this laugh. It's just, it's just, and I laugh easily and often. Um, the people who know me, you know, you ask my mom or uh, anybody who knows me well, and they'll say, if Jeff's unhappy, wait five minutes. Now I've got a special bonus tip from Jeff on how to focus on your core values that I think is gonna help. But before that, it's time for the three point landing questions. Let's go from just watching a video to taking action. Here we go. Question number one, what's the thing that you need to just make happen this week? Number two, what does being a good leader mean to you? And number three, what does a day one culture look like for your business? And if you're gonna take some action after this video, give me a hashtag believe down in the comments as well. We do so many different things. So this is the question I sometimes get. How can you do so many different things? Why don't you stick to the knitting? The kind of traditional advice would be to stay focused and keep the business simple. And I, I, the, the way I think about this is we actually do stick to one thing. It's just not um, described. It's not the business itself. We do web services, which is you know big enterprises buying compute services from us, and we have our retail business, and we have Amazon Studios, which is making original content, and Amazon Go, the things you listed. So, but the the cultural thread that runs through all of these things is the same. We only have a few principles at Amazon kind of core values that we go back to over and over again. And if you looked at each of the things that we do, you would see those run straight through everything. So the first one, and by far the most important one, is customer obsession. And we talk about it as customer obsession as opposed to competitor obsession. And I have seen over and over again companies talk about that they're customer focused, but really, when I pay close attention to them, I believe they are competitor focused. And that's just a completely different mentality. By the way, competitor focus can work, um, but I don't think it works in the long run as well as customer focused. For one thing, once you're the leader, if your whole culture is competitor obsessed, it's kind of hard to stay energized and motivated if you're out in front. Um, whereas customers are always unsatisfied, they're always discontent, they always want more, and so no matter how far you get out there in front of your competitors, you're still behind your customers. So they're always pulling you along. So customer obsession is a deep principle that underlies everything we do. Another one is eagerness to invent. So we love to pioneer. And when we have done, by the way, whenever we have tried to do something in a kind of me too fashion, we have failed at it. Um, we need to have something that is differentiated, unique, uh, something that customers are gonna like that we're kind of leading with. So that's another element that works for us. And then uh, another one is long-term thinking. We are willing to, uh, to, to take some time and be patient with our business initiatives and that runs through everything. So a lot of our competitors might have, have two to three year kind of time frames and we might have more of a five to seven year sort of time frame. And then the last one, operational excellence. So li literally, you know, how do you have high standards around, you know, identifying defects, fixing defects at the root, all of those kinds of things that lead to what I think also can be in a simpler way just stated as professionalism, that you want to do things right just for the sake of doing them right. If you want Jeff Bezos' advice on work-life balance, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. I don't even like the phrase work-life balance. I think it's misleading. If you're giving a great customer experience, um,